We are here to talk about Peter Maxwell Davies' Lighthouse, and we are delighted to welcome, making his operatic debut staging this production, the artistic director of Dallas Theater Center, Kevin Moriarty. Thank you. Also making his Dallas Opera debut, Andrew Bidlack. And two returning artists who uh, have had great international careers everywhere and we're thrilled to have them both back. Um, Robert Orth, who created the role uh, that was uh, just repeated in San Diego from Moby Dick. Um, Bob is uh, renowned for his interpretation of, of contemporary music and uh, also returning after many years, uh, last role was Timor and Torandot a number of years ago, uh, and uh, it, it, it's a, amazing, it's been like 10 years since you were here. Um, so we welcome back Daniel Sumegi. <laughs> since you've been here all afternoon, you've heard quite a bit about the complexity of the music. Um, it is a challenge, and I, I think that's what most of us will be interested in hearing uh, the singers talk about. Um, let me start with Dan, who um, has said to me privately that um, he has had more coachings on this than, than anything else he's ever done. It's not a very long piece, but what is it about the music that's so difficult for any singer to master? Um, I would say the music, the orchestral part of the music, is uh, similar to what you would hear at any modern chamber music recital. Uh, and so it's uh, challenging to listen to. And then on top of that, you have an equally challenging vocal line that bears little relation to the orchestral part, and they have to come together somehow. Uh, and when you uh, explore the piece, as we have done in the last week of rehearsals, and uh, you, you unfold a lot of information, and it does come together really interestingly well. And uh, when you uh, stop panicking about it, uh, as I can uh, safely say we've all done, um, uh, then you, you see what it really is. And it's a, it's a riveting little horror story, actually. Uh, Bob. This is challenging in many ways, not just musically, but also theatrically, because you uh, are, are to uh, embody two completely different characters. You're first, you are um, the, uh, in the court of inquiry. Uh, the the, the uh, rescue ship has come and is reporting to um, the, the authorities you know, uh, an evaluation of what has happened. And then in the opera itself, the, the uh, three singers become the actual lighthouse keepers who have disappeared. Um, what challenges does that, does that bring to you? Not only just the, the musical challenges, but also creating these distinct characters. Um, it's, I don't think that part of it is too difficult because the, uh, the officers, one, two, and three, um, especially at the beginning, are sort of disembodied. But we have found it, it, it's become more challenging than I expected because of Kevin's viewpoint on it. it it's, it's been told you this is a mystery, a ghost story. So even in our version, you'll be left to wonder what really did happen. Um, but Kevin has a very specific point of view. So now there's more to the officers than originally we thought. Um, but for me, it's fairly, it's not too difficult because my character, Blazes, uh, who's the actual lighthouse keeper, is so extreme uh, that uh, you know, I, don't, I don't need to do anything big to differentiate between him and Officer Two, who's the testifying officer. But um, it's, you know, it's, it, it's challenging as much as we're learning about it as we go along. Like I just said to the guys, I don't want to give anything away, but we, were, we had lunch today together and, and I said, you know, I was thinking about this last night and that one scene where we enter at the end, if what has happened is what Kevin has decided has happened, it's perfectly logical, the way we deliver those lines is going to be totally different than the way we originally thought of those lines and learned those lines. So, you know, you're constantly rethinking things. 
Kevin's constantly rethinking things. <laughs> <laughs> and, he, and I think he felt a little bad about it, and so I told him that Lenny Folio, who's a friend of his who directed uh, uh, Moby Dick, and I've done several operas with Lenny. Lenny, especially with Moby Dick, would come into rehearsals where, uh, you know, we, there were all these, did you see Moby Dick? There were all these ropes and all this stuff, which he wasn't really sure how all this was going to work at first. So every day at rehearsal, I would say, or somebody would say, well, what do we do here? Do we take this over there? And he would always say, we'll know when the director shows up. <laughs> <laughs> so, so even though we've only been here one week, things have changed so often. And, and it's fine. It's part of the process. And, you know, we're all learning and figuring this thing out and developing a point of view. I mean, we could have gone in any number of directions, and it's the director's job to sort of decide which way we're going in our particular interpretation. Andrew, uh, you have, I guess you would kind of describe it as the juvenile lead in this, the, the more innocent, naive of the, of the characters. He can't do anything else. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's typecasting. Uh, actually, for those of you who don't know, Andrew uh, created the role of Greenhorn in the workshop of Moby Dick when it was first uh, worked on in uh, uh, San Francisco. And uh, so he is, is no stranger to doing contemporary works, but this is contemporary in a very different musical style. Um, was this uh, particularly challenging for you too, or what, what um, did you think when you were first looking at the score, when I first asked you to do this, you, you must have had some initial reaction. <laughs> like, well, oh. be careful. I think, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, we started working on, I think we were discussing this maybe last March or something, and I went to the New York Public Library and found a score of it, and you know, you can tell just from looking at it within a few minutes that this is probably one of the most difficult pieces of music from a singer's perspective that <laughs> exists. So um, I immediately ordered the score and I, I started working on it literally a page a day because there's just, there's just so much intricacy in each part, each page of the music, whether it's rhythmically or, um, you know, vocally or even the notes and everything. So it was a very long process for me. This score has been with me much longer than most of the parts that I that I learn and everything. Um, and one of the challenges is that, you know, Maxwell Davies did give my character a lot of very linear um, vocal music and, and legato singing that some of the other characters don't get as much. And um, it's it's a challenge to find those and bring those out in a way that doesn't make it sound that makes it sound like music and not just you know strange contemporary mishmash, which is um, you know I think very easy to do with contemporary music, and that's part of the challenges of being a uh, someone that sings contemporary music well is being able to do it and make music out of it, and that was um, one of the things I've been really exploring as I've learned this role. Earlier when we were talking about the music of the piece and Peter Maxwell Davies' uh, musical style, um, it was mentioned that it is written at the extremes and beyond <laughs> of, of all of the singers. Uh, Bob in particular, you have to sing in... Over four octaves. Which, may I demonstrate? Oh, <laughs> Pretty, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Pretty simple. <laughs> but dramatically engaging. <laughs> um, you were you were talking about uh, the director's point of view, so that's a perfect segue for to, to talk to Kevin. How do you um, approach an opera? Uh, is it any different than the way you would if someone sent you a play to direct? Uh, I'd say with more humility, uh, more confusion, <laughs> more trepidation, uh, all of those things. No, I'd say the big differences uh, would be you know, uh, 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 pretty much the directing work I do at this point in my life. When I was younger, I just had to direct any job opportunity that came my way. But now I, I pretty much can pick the projects I do. I tend to either do classical works like Shakespeare, where you have a very wide interpretive freedom, because as, as you would if you were doing, say, a Verdi opera or a Mozart opera, where the composer is dead, the work is in public domain, the company wants you to put a stamp on it, that's why the people are gonna come to see your interpretation of that piece. And if they don't like it, and half of them won't, they can always rent a movie, read the script on the, uh, on the internet, they can uh, go to see another production, sometimes in the same town in the same year. So you don't really worry that, uh, the, that your version of Romeo and Juliet, whether the play or for that matter the opera, you don't really worry that that's the only opportunity people are going to have to see or read or understand Romeo and Juliet. 
The other kind of work that I do that we do a lot of at the theater center is new work, musicals and plays where, which are, are new. Well, in that case, the experience is completely different. As a director, uh, writers are handing you very early drafts of material, and the dialogue you're having with them is not about how would you take this old material and make it fresh for today. It's the dialogue with them about here's what you see they're trying to do, and then they either say yes or no, and if they say that's not what I'm trying to do, then your job is to point out why you got that from their text so that they can go back and change the text. So, for instance, if a scene is too slow, if the dramatic actions the characters are playing, the things the characters want and need are unclear, if the jokes don't land, part of the arsenal that you have at your disposal is to say to the writer, this joke isn't funny you should rewrite the joke. You say that really nicely, and that takes a while to say it, but, but that's the dialogue that you have. Uh, this piece is completely different, because for one thing, we can't and wouldn't want to change anything in it. It, it, it is not a brand new piece with a writer saying, oh, this melody's not completely clear to you, or the, the rhythm's not, or the, the, the text isn't, oh, well, I'll, let me add another, let me add a coda to that, or let me change the key of it, or, or for that matter, let me just write new words or cut some of the music or things like that. It, it's, it's not that, it's, a, it's an established fixed piece of music. And yet, most audiences have never heard it. Most viewers don't know the story. The piece is not uh, in the mainstream of the canon. So uh, as a director, I feel a kind of need to get the piece as immediately and directly to the audience to experience what the composer intended, even if some of the things the composer intended are more uh, complicated, more layered, uh, more difficult than maybe even I can make sense of after a year of studying it. And so that, that has been a unique challenge. That would be different if we were all working on Marriage Figaro, uh, and that, or, or for that matter, Hamlet. Uh, you know, the, you know that when you're in, that's different when you're in the, the, the kind of core of the old canon, or for that matter, if we were workshopping a brand new piece of music theater, whether that's classified on the musical side like Sondheim or the opera side like Jake Hagee, where the dialogue would have more immediate give and take. You'd literally turn to the composer or the librettist and say, wait a minute, what's going on in this part of the story here? We, the costume designer needs to know so they can figure out how to, how, you know, to dress the character more sinisterly or more innocently, or the singer needs to know so that we can figure out that interpretation. So I'd say that has been by far the biggest unique challenge of this piece. Earlier, uh, Wayne Lee Gay was saying that um, Peter Maxwell Davies had studied with Milton Babbitt as did Stephen Sondheim. So there's not that much difference, perhaps, than <laughs> Maxwell Davies and Stephen Sondheim. But I'm curious about one thing. When I first- Two roads asked, diverged yeah. in a wood. <laughs> a very, very- It's all about choices. Big yeah. divergence. Um, but when I first sent you the, the, the CD and asked you to do this, how much has your I, uh, ideas about the piece changed? About what happened and, and uh, the character relationships? and, and and your initial reaction versus where you are now in the rehearsal process. Uh, well, I would say, and this may not speak well for my uh, intellectual ability, but uh, when I first encountered the piece, I had a relatively direct, immediate, visceral response to it. I, uh, I was actually in a Starbucks. I had a score. I listened oh, to the entire thing with the score in front of me <laughs> for an hour and 20 minutes in, uh, in the Starbucks in the West Village and uh, on a Saturday afternoon. And, uh, and had an immediate visceral sense of, here's what's happening to the characters, here's, what the, here's what's going on, including the ending, I mean, which is a, somewhat of a, of a mystery. And I, and I had a, a pretty strong sense of that. And that stayed relatively uh, kind of confident in my mind as Beowulf and I worked on the set, Claudia and I on the costumes, Tyler and I on the lighting design. And as you saw from the dates, uh, on the set design, that was uh, about a year ago that most of those conversations were happening with Beowulf and I as we were storyboarding and all that. Then we put it away. And I have to say, when I've come back to the material in the last couple months, all of that has suddenly seemed <laughs> inadequate in every way. Because what I've discovered, the more time I've spent with the piece, spent with the piece, the more I've realized that not only are the things I felt and experienced about the story, I, we're literally just talking plot, the level of what happened, uh, it, it, not only are those things true, 
but also a whole bunch of contradictory other things are true. And so the more, and that as, as I got to know the conductor, as I got to read about the piece, as I got to spend more and more time hearing it and hear others talk about the piece, the more I realized, oh my goodness, there's not one thing going on, there's 20, and the 20 things can't coexist because they are contradictory. Uh, which is, can be true in a poem, it can be true in a work of literature, that two things can kind of both be true or not true. You know, the word perhaps is a great word when you're analyzing James Joyce. Um, uh, but it is not so helpful in, in theatrical work like opera or, or in uh, plays because plays and operas exist in real time. Time goes forward. And that means you're processing in real time. It's not like a poem which exists outside of time. Most poems you can flip back and flip back and read and reread and layer your sense of meaning on. Very few people are going to have a layered experience when they, ex when they hear and see The Lighthouse. Except because it'll they can be come to all three performances. <laughs> Which is actually, honestly, and, and you know, at the risk of sounding like a shill for, for marketers or something like that, <laughs> this piece would actually, I think you would discover if you, and in fact, I said this just yesterday, I think in, in rehearsal, I suddenly realized, well, we have to design the piece as we're, as we're working on it so that when you get to the end, if you come back and watch it again, that you'll actually see what happens at the end embedded in the beginning, but not enough that we tip our hands so that you, we don't want you to know what's going to happen at the end, but it should ultimately be a circle. So uh, I actually think with a lot of contemporary music, and this would be true with Webern or Berg or Schoenberg or God save us all, Milton Babbitt, but, um, but certainly with the serialist list, hearing the music over and over actually does constantly reveal new levels of meaning, just like a complicated modernist piece of literature. If you go back and reread Ulysses every year, you actually do get something deeper and more out of it. Dan, do you feel the same way? I mean, did, when you arrived after having spent a year, more or less, learning the music, um, you must have had a very clear idea of who your character was and what Arthur represented in the piece. But did you feel that after working with Kevin and Nicole, the conductor, um, has that changed for you? Uh, well, I, I came with a, a lot of uh, uh, non-clarity. I knew what my what my person was, but I didn't know how he fitted in with the rest of it. And Kevin, Kevin has helped us unlock that uh, with his di directorial vision. Uh, there's, there are, there are uh, several stories happening at once, and it's very hard to show that, and it's very hard to uh, see that when you're looking at it on the page and listening to a recording of it. You, you need the visual aspect as well, which you, we're going to have. And Kevin uh, really has helped me to understand very clearly what's happening. Um, so, thank you. Are you Kevin. available after every performance to explain it to all of us? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think, actually, uh, it won't need explaining once you come and see it. It's going to be very clear. Okay. Bob, uh, same, same question. I mean. When you arrive for this, but, but I, I, typically for any production, you obviously, unlike a, an actor in the spoken theater, um, who learn on their feet, they don't arrive having memorized the play, um, you have to have done a great deal of work to get to the point where you can begin rehearsing an opera. So you have made choices, or at least you should have at least thought about a lot of possibilities. How has this been impacted by working with a director when you arrive and suddenly his ideas are maybe not the same as yours. Well, you're right. You have to have some, well, you can't help but have some ideas from the work that you've done. But you have to, whether you've done a production, you know, 20 different productions of a standard piece, or whether it's the first production that you've done of a, of a very unusual piece, you have to come to some degree as a blank page and, you know, and fit into the director's vision of what the piece is. And so, you know, you, you try to, it's, it's easier to do in something like this. Now, if I do The Lighthouse again after this, and I would love to, having spent all this time learning these notes, <laughs> <laughs> um, th then, then it becomes more difficult. You know, well, just an example. When, the first time you do Barbara Seville, you know, the director says, you know, do this, do this, do this, and you go, oh, yeah, okay. So you totally commit to it so you can do a, a great performance. And then you go to the next production of Barbara Seville, and you start doing the stuff that you were totally convinced was the best way to do Barbara Seville, and the director's going, what? What are you, what are you doing? <laughs> and they say, don't do that. And they go, 
oh, okay. So then there's this whole mind thing that goes, I guess I was wrong. I guess, I guess, and the whole rehearsal process, believe me, for years then becomes, I guess I was wrong. Because, you know, every time you go to do it again someplace, the director says, you know, no, we're not doing that. We're not doing that. So this is nice in this, because we all really are blank pages, and Kevin, you know, gets to draw on us whatever he wants. Now, the next director that I come to, if I get to do this again, will have a problem, because I'll go, well, but this is what we did before. <laughs> no, I won't do that, but it's hard not to. <laughs> you know, and, and no mention, I know you're going to ask about it eventually, but let me just say that our conductor, Nicole, has did so much in the couple of days that she was here before she had to leave to, to to take away our nerves and our trepidations. She is just, we're all just going like this because it was so clear and so clean and all this stuff that, and thank God there's a recording. Uh, oftentimes we have to learn, especially for premieres of things, without a recording. But we had learned from the recording, but the recording you don't see the beat, you don't feel the beat in, in something like this because the, the composer has done his absolute best to destroy the beat. Uh, and, uh, but with Nicole, you see it, and she's so clean, and we're all just going, oh my gosh, we are so fortunate to have this woman conducting this. Because, and I said to her at one point, do you teach conducting? Because you should teach conducting, and I could send a few conductors to you. Yeah, you <laughs> some really famous ones. So she has, she's the unseen person here, but she has done a lot, not only musically, but I know you discussed, Kevin and, and uh, Nicole have discussed a lot about you know, dramatically, what she hears in the music, and she's brilliant, and she, you know, she can point out to Kevin, who then has been relaying to us what is happening in the music that gives us clues as to what our characters are and what is happening dramatically, so she's remarkable. Nicole, uh, who is making her debut with us, uh, is the artistic director of an, a, a contemporary music group in San Francisco called Ensemble Parallel, um, and she had to leave in the middle of our first week of rehearsal to go back to San Francisco for a concert that was being recorded. So that's why she has not been here for several days and is not here this afternoon. So I thought I should explain that. She is due back uh, almost any minute, but unfortunately not in None time. too soon. Not, not uh, in time to be here this afternoon. Um, I'm delighted. Hmm? Can you reach that water? Oh, oh, Sandy's picking her up, so he knows. Good. Thank um, you. <laughs> the official airline of the Dallas Opera. Thank you, American Airlines. Hey, Jonathan, I just wanted to echo what Bob said. Something I think that's unique about this about this process for for most of us, uh, if it, it compared to most opera work that we do, is that everybody involved in this process—the conductor, the stage director, the singers, the designers—we're all. This is the very first time any of us have ever approached this piece of music or this story or these characters. The, the process, I imagine, and you would all know more than me, would be radically different if we were approaching a major canonical work because most of us, designers, conductors, singers, would all be coming at it from a, such a variety of past experiences. We would have studied it in school. We would have uh, 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 sung it and, and, and seen very significant productions in our lives that would have etched on our brains. And so we'd all be bringing a lot of expectations and baggage into the room. Now, there's a bad part about that because there can become a certain kind of, you can have 30 productions going on at the same time on stage, you know, all the way down to the choristers and each of the designers and all of that. Uh, on the other hand, the advantage of that is that you also have a sense on the very first day of rehearsal that you know, even if you're surrounded by people who have no clue what they're doing, you're going to be just fine because everybody at least has a production of Traviata in them. It just may all not be the same one. This is a little bit, I think, for all of us, in some ways, uh, uh, more thrilling because we're we're starting as close to a blank slate as a team of people could start uh, with no prior experience on this work. Uh, and, and so in a way that's really exciting, but of course the scary part of that is on the very first day, you know, when, when Nicole is about to drop that first downbeat in rehearsal, you have absolutely no idea what you're going to hear. And the same thing is true when, you know, Beowulf first said, well, let's make a set for the lighthouse. And, and we all said, okay, well, let's start to figure out how to move around the space. It's not really like you say, well, let's just, you know, do it like the last 20 times we've done it before. So that, that is, a, it's, it seems unique. May, well, may I say that, excuse me, that, that one of the joys of being a singer is, is being able to um, spend so much time with, with this music. And, uh, and I hope it's not scary to you to say that 
I wish you had more time with it because whether you know it or not, you know, you've heard, even if you didn't go to the opera, you would have heard a lot of Mozart, you would have heard a lot of Verdi, you would have heard, you know, just sort of it's in the air in, in Western culture. Uh, this music, maybe you've not heard so much of that. And we get to spend weeks with it and, and, and our brain starts to make connections uh, to it that we didn't even know were possible and it really starts to sound different than it will sound to you the first time you hear it. And, and uh, it, you, it needs repeated hearings, you know. It just well, I, I think it, it's safe to say that it's not fair to any composer to only hear a piece once. Right. Um, uh, the more familiar you are with something, the more you can appreciate it. The, the thing that I find so intriguing, of course, is that singers, whenever they show up for a job, it's like the first day of school. <laughs> and they, they, ha they arrive in a strange city or maybe even a place they know very well, but there's a new director, a new conductor, and everyone wants to be the teacher's pet, the star student, and they want <laughs> everything. So that's the way. That's it. That's what's supposed to work. But, the, but the pressure, <laughs> the pressure to, to, to be at your best, um, Andrew, maybe you can talk about this, that, that feeling of, okay, now I'm... I've learned this on my own, by myself, or with a coach, but suddenly I have all of my colleagues, and then there is a director and a conductor who are sitting there with folding their arms and going, okay, show me <laughs> what you can do. How do you deal with that? I will say, and, and my wife will definitely second this, that the first day of the musical rehearsal that starts every job is definitely the most nervous part of the whole production for me. Um, and I've had a lot of experience being, being a new kid. I moved around a lot, and I was a new kid eight times from kindergarten to high school, and it definitely feels like that a lot. And you come in and you meet new people that you've never, in this case, I've never worked with anybody that, in this cast before. And um, specifically in this case, I was, you know, I knew that I'm younger and less experienced than anybody in the room, and, you know, that doesn't mean that the expectations are any different, and I have to bring myself up to this level. and. I think um, you do that by really preparing and knowing that you know the piece and you have to deliver, and that's what we do as performers. I mean, we have to, you know, in some way, shape, or form, whether we, whether it's a, an athlete or any anything else like that, you do this because you can find that thing inside you that makes you bring it when it's time. <laughs> I don't know how else to say it. And, but is the energy, and, and any of you can answer this, um, suddenly, you know, you, you've learned this on your own, but suddenly you're with your colleagues. Did, what, what happens with the first time you go through a piece musically, and suddenly you're not having to fill in in your imagination all the other parts? I, I think it's actually very exciting because you're, you know, then for the first time you're, you're not listening to the voices and instruments on the recording singing or whatever, you're hearing yourself sing it and, the, and your colleagues sing it. And it, you know, when, it, when it's the right mix, and this is definitely the right mix, this cast and everything, it, it's a very exciting experience. And you know, I, you, I don't know, I had a, a smile the first day of rehearsal. It was very in, in my, hard, <laughs> but you know, it, it, was, it was a very enjoyable experience, I think. Too. In my case, uh, I, except for the first time I got the CD and opened the score for the first time, and I listened to the thing from beginning to end, and I went, oh, <laughs> how am I going to learn that? Um, <laughs> Uh, I didn't actually uh, hear any of the other parts of the opera except my lines until the first day we came together and I was sitting there listening going, oh, that's cool, that's <laughs> nice, oh, that's a nice bit. <laughs> well, let me just say that even though I am closer to death than anyone else up here, <laughs> I still, that first day of rehearsal, it, 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 the only word that comes to mind is vulnerable. You feel very, very vulnerable. And, and my wife knows, it's just part of my process, that the first day that I'm somewhere, I often tell her, I'm coming home, I'm not staying, I'm coming home. <laughs> and you expect to be fired, and you expect you know, all kinds of terrible things to happen. You just feel totally vulnerable. And um, it's, it's hard, but it gets better. <laughs> well, hi historically, I, I, I've seen this happen many, many times over the years I've been here, that the conductor who leads the first rehearsal musically, they go through the score like a table read in the theater. You start at the beginning and you go all the way through it and the conductor will make notes and stop someone if there's something that they don't like or they want something done slightly differently or um, the, God forbid the singer isn't really prepared. <laughs> um, but usually uh, there are those sadistic conductors who will take whoever the first voice is of the day and they are the example. Oh. 
and they really? instill the fear of God. So I've often had to warn people who sing the Mandarin in Turandot or, or the Angelotti in Tosca, which is the first voice that you hear, just be prepared. You are going to be the example and the conductor is going to be merciless. And so you don't just break out in tears and run from the room crying. Um, and it, it, it is very difficult because you want to be your best, but somehow the tone of the whole process is being said in those first few minutes, so it can be very daunting. And in many, many European opera houses, uh, by the time the first break is over, which is after the first 90 minutes of rehearsal, the person who wasn't good will be already out and they'll be on the phone finding a new person. Mm -hmm. So we, we are very aware of that, that if you're not on top of it, you'll be fired that that's, day. That's why I love singing in America. That's not usually. Yeah. <laughs> actually, but I know what you're talking about. I've seen it here, too. Actually, yeah. we have fired people after the first music <laughs> word. <laughs> See, now, and I do like want to say, European opera house. this is a way, and this was very, very striking to me on the, very, on the first day of rehearsals at Lighthouse. This is completely unlike anything that happens in either uh, musical theater or in uh, plays. Uh, this first rehearsal thing. If you're doing the first rehearsal of a play, typically after you welcome everybody and talk about the concept and all of that sort of thing, you sit down around a table and you read the play out loud. Well, most actors, when they're reading a play out loud, uh, don't uh, don't inflect the text in any way. They they kind of mumble their way through it. Sometimes you can't even hear them, uh, uh, and certainly they're not playing their hand of showing you any sense of what their interpretation or the performance will be. You just kind of read it out loud just to make sure everybody kind of you know has gotten through all the words, and then you jump into the real work of eight hours a day for three or four or five weeks of crafting it all together, and then then the actors do full-on acting. And, and they, in fact, often don't have it even memorized. Definitely not. In fact, in, in acting school, uh, universities, when you're getting a master's degree or whatever, they would teach you not to memorize the part in advance. Uh, typically, the only actors who have lines memorized on the first day of a theater production would be um, actors who are a bit older and have problems memorizing lines. And it's kind of understood that if that's hard for you, you might show up. But you would never expect an actor in their 30s, early 40s, their 20s to show up off book. That would actually be sort of odd because you'd think, oh, they've made too many choices already. How are you going to discover it together? Well, so that's, and, and the other thing I should say is that in a play, of course, the director is the primary person setting tempo and interpretation, even inflection. But of course, when you're reading a play out loud, there's no, you can't affect tempo. And what are you going to start beating on the table or something and make them go faster? That, you, that's not possible. So the only way to set those things is through rehearsal. On the other hand, the first day of Lighthouse rehearsals, Nicole, who's the conductor and who does, in fact, make those decisions about tempo and dynamics and interpretive sorts of things like that, she gives that downbeat, and that means her interpretation is right out there up front that they're all expected to kind of instantly be a part of. Now, the other flip side of that is, so when, when we're doing musicals, in, if you're doing a musical, say, on Broadway and everybody shows up, you wouldn't even do a read-through on the first day. You'd talk about the show, review the set designs, all of that. If you read the script, when you get to songs, either the composer would sing them, or the piano player, the music director would sing them, or you'd just skip them. Or maybe you'd speak the text out loud so that you're following story. And then you'd send people to coachings. Often you don't even read the script at all. Often on the first two, three days of a musical, everybody is just spending their time in different rooms, uh, learning the songs uh, in private, all of that. You don't put all that together for many days. So to be in a room where on the very first day, they kind of instantly stepped forward and said, a score that is more complicated than I could possibly make sense of myself while following a conductor's interpretation and singing even in harmony, very complicated harmonies, with each other, and they'd never sung with each other before. That is uh, that is a, a, a complete um, mystery to me on the theater side. And as you can imagine, I immediately uh, left the rehearsal at the end of rehearsal that day and went to the, to the actors in our building uh, who are working on another play, and I said, you are not going to believe what opera singers are prepared to do. <laughs> and then I said, you're all slackers. <laughs> <laughs> we could save a lot of time and money if you'd all act like opera singers around here. <laughs> one, one other significant difference, which I think is, is interesting and must have been kind of uh, difficult, perhaps, in some ways for you, is that when you direct a play, you cast it. You pick the actors. You had given me some ideas of what you thought the characters were, 
but had to trust me to come up with the people who could embody those physical characteristics and yet still be able to sing the music. It's a huge difference, and you know, it's it's not only that, that Jonathan cast the singers who I don't personally you, you know know or had worked with. On a play or a musical, you typically I would do the first step that I did with Jonathan, which is write up character descriptions, uh, find everything that characters say about themselves, about each other, then come up with what you know you think they physically look like, all those kind of things. But then at that point, a casting director would go out and find all the people who could suit that role, ask if they were interested, available, and then they'd come in and they'd do auditions. On a musical, that means first they'd come in and sing a couple songs uh, uh, from their own repertoire that's similar in style to the type of show. So if it's our musical of Giant that we just did by Michael John Lacusa, maybe they'd come in and sing some Rodgers and Hammerstein or Jerome Kern or something like that. Then if they get called back, if they're one of, say, the top five or six choices for the role, you give them songs from the show and you say, you have a couple days, learn this, and here are scenes, go learn these scenes, and then come back and perform those. This can sometimes go on for three or four callbacks. You could be seeing five or six choices for even the small roles in a show uh, two, three, four times. And they're, they're, they're giving performances and then you get to work with them so then you can stop and say well you know hey that your version of Billy Bigelow in this song is interesting but what if he's more violent and dark what if you crawl around the floor while you're singing that what if you try it uh, you know a little more aggressively and so you can you not only get a sense of what their voice is like their their uh, physical approach is like but you also get a sense of how you work together in the room because somebody might come in and blow you away at the first audition you think they are amazing so then in the second one you intentionally give them contradictory direction just to see what that, uh, how they take direction, as we say. And you can find, oh, they can only do it one way. So you better either really, really like that one way, or you better get a more supple actor who has more flexibility in their approach. So yeah, it is very different to walk into a room and, uh, and say, oh, we don't have any. That also means in the first day of rehearsal in a play, you already have a rapport. You, so coming in on the first day, I would already know, well, this actor, it's best to just say, cross stage left, stand there, turn on the downbeat, and point. And this actor, it's better to say, okay, so what your character wants is to be free. So find a way to get from stage right to stage left with as much urgency as possible to be free. In both cases, they're gonna, you know, go there, stop, turn, but it's just, you know, you learn, you know those things just from auditions. Here, we're all learning everything about each other from scratch, which is um, a, a, a very unusual thing in the theater side. But may I say that one of the nice things about this, and it, it it's a small cast, uh, you know, one director and one conductor and three singers. Is it, it's so far, it's been very collaborative, and that is the most rewarding for, mm -hmm. for us. Uh, starting with the first day of rehearsals, what you were describing, Daniel, in Europe, and what you were describing, Jonathan, uh, sometimes with conductors, it, it's, it's about a power play. You know, and that's why you see the, the famed diva-ish behavior, and that's why you see the, the, the killer conductors and things like that. They're trying to establish their power. And uh, you know, that's, I don't work well under those conditions. I don't know who does, maybe somebody does. But in our situation, uh, we've all remarked either to you or when you weren't around, just how gratifying <laughs> it is, <laughs> how gratifying it is to, you know, to have our ideas respected and accepted or at least considered, um, and especially on a new piece like this, but even in standard repertoire, you know, it's, it's very unrewarding as a singer to come and have somebody say, go stand over there, put your hand like this, you know, uh, it's, you know, I'm not a mannequin, you know, <laughs> I have a brain, <laughs> and so these kinds of rehearsals are, are the best, not to have someone there sort of intimidating you into doing something. But there are directors and conductors who prefer singers without brains. I'm, well, that's I'm true. sorry to say. <laughs> Listening to you go on, Kevin, though, I couldn't help but wonder what you think of the new NBC series, Smash. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I actually really, really, really love it. Because if you're not watching it, you really should. You can download it at iTunes. You can, uh, it's fabulous. It's on Sunday nights, and it's about putting together a Broadway musical, and the whole audition process that you were describing is exactly what the first two episodes have been all about. It's, so. it, and the TV show's created all by uh, pretty significant Broadway uh, uh, directors and writers, and so it's pretty accurate. As far as a TV show can be, it's the most accurate behind-the-scenes TV show I've ever seen about what it's like in the theater. So we're waiting for the operatic version. Yeah. <laughs> All right, I'm sure you have questions, so let's turn it over to the floor. Roger? Where are you putting the orchestra? Yes, the question is where are we putting the orchestra? Uh, it will be in a pit. Uh, there is a pit in one of the configurations of the Wiley, which is infinitely changeable. Um, the one thing, though, that is different and uh, is significantly challenging is that although there has 
been musicals like uh, Superman <laughs> that used the orchestra pit, or Giant had them on, the orchestra on stage. Uh, it's never been done in the Wiley unamplified. This is natural acoustic, right. so we really don't know what the sound is going to be like. <laughs> so we have numerous ideas of how, on very short notice, we can change things, try different configurations within the confines of the setup. Yes, in the back, Dr. Gay. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Greg? Uh, I've got a question for Mr. Moriarty uh, about see, coming to this totally fresh, never seen it before. Well, maybe it's for singers also, but if you've never seen it before and you've got your ideas, of it, is, would, it, would it have been helpful? It, would you want to even see another production of it? Do you even see like Boston did or on, on the video that's available on the internet? Would you like to repeat the question? Uh, yeah, the question is about hey, would it be helpful or have been helpful for me to have seen other productions? And the answer is yes, definitely it, it would have been. Uh, and absolutely, I think, uh, when I was a young director, I would say the official directing answer, if we were in directing school, I, I taught directing grad school at Brown University for seven years. My grad students would have always said, uh, as most young directors would, that if you're going to direct you know, Hamlet, you want to make sure that you've never seen Hamlet before, that you forget it all, and that if you get a script and it has stage directions, you know, and it says the character angrily walks over to the other side of the stage, you should cross that out so that everything is coming out of your brain. Uh, and now that I'm older, I actually find it immensely helpful to be able, if I was going to direct a, a major canonical uh, opera, I would do what I do with a classical play, which is watch everything I can watch, read everything I can read, travel around. It's more helpful for me to see five than one, it, it, just because then you start, what you see, what happens with five, you read it, you get your own opinions, you think this is what happens. And then you go see five productions and you realize they have five other opinions, equally strongly held. And that actually, instead of making you feel like, well, I need to copy one of those, simply opens up all of the possibilities so that you feel like, okay, Okay, now I can I can make sense of what I'm responding to and the part that's connected to me and my values, aesthetic values and personal values and all of that. So yeah, if there, if there had been a plethora of lighthouse materials out there, I uh, I would have pilfered them. It's interesting because pilfered, singers pilfered. often say that they pilfered. don't listen to recordings of other singers in uh, learning roles, um, but I think that's rather foolish. Um, I think it would be stupid to listen to just one and then copy it, but when you have the wealth of recorded material and you can hear the great singers of the last century, uh, their interpretations, um, it does free you up in a, in a remarkable way because you realize that there are so many different ways that are equally valid. And uh, the, an example I used to use, um, uh, I was just on a jury uh, over the weekend judging a competition in New York, and one of the other jurors was the great soprano Renata Scotto. And when Renata was doing Manon Lescaut at the Met, there were uh, bars of music that she sang in a particular way that were, were revelation, and it was not what was in the score. And it was only later that I realized it was the only way she could sing those phrases. Mm -hmm. But she was so compelling and so committed that you began to think that was the only way it should ever be done. <laughs> and I think those are the kinds of things that you learn when you have a chance. Now, of course, there's only one recording of The Lighthouse, um, and I'm not absolutely convinced it is the definitive recording. I have a lot of problems with it. I think somewhat subjectively that our production is a much better cast and I think it will be much more interesting musically. But um, it, it's, I think, really exciting when you have that opportunity. I don't know how the rest of you feel. When you learn a role, do you like to listen to other recordings? I, I like to listen to everything I can uh, get my hands on. Uh, the, pro the problem with listening to recordings is that uh, some people rely on that to actually learn the music. Uh, and they mm -hmm. don't go away and coach it, so they copy all the mistakes. <laughs> and uh, recordings are filled with mistakes. Uh, so that's where the problem arises. Uh, but as far as uh, listening to other singers, absolutely. Everything I can get my hands on. We had a, an experience a few years ago with a soprano who had lost her score and had gone away on holiday and learned her music off of a recording. Mm -hmm. And she arrived, and you know, she was utterly charming, but completely wrong about half of the score. And it was a, not a, you know, it, it, the, direct, uh, the, the conductor was just beside himself, but eventually she learned how to 
correct many of her mistakes. When I was very young, and, and I uh, used the Toreador song for a few auditions, and I sang the Toreador song in French uh, for John Moriarty one time. And after I was done, I knew John. He had hired me a couple times, and he said, did you learn that from the Robert Merrill recording? And I said, <laughs> and I said yeah, yeah, I did. Uh -huh. He says, his French is terrible. <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> Amazing. Andrew, do you have anything to... Uh... Um, well, yeah, I think, you know, now that YouTube is around and everything, we can find recordings of every singer singing just about anything, and including there's actual recordings of the lighthouse out there, <laughs> which is kind of interesting to see. And, and I looked at those learning this role, trying to see, like, you know, just good ideas about how people interpreted this and everything. But uh, I, definitely from a singer perspective, you can... You know, there's a reason that these people were considered great singers, and they solve problems that, when you're learning a role, you're trying to solve, whether it be technically or, you know, even interpretations with the language and everything. And uh, it's, I think, it's a great resource. And if you were to ignore it, I, I think, um, you know, we don't live in 19th century Italy, so we don't have that, you know, level of interpretation that those people got from the people that lived there. I think, you know. Other questions. All the way in the back. Parents, I know and hope that this will not be the birth of many, many, many ventures in the Dallas Theater Center and the Dallas Opera. You are the best. <laughs> Kevin, would you like to comment on that? <laughs> I disagree entirely. No, I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, no, I do. One of the one of the uh, uh, side benefits of this process, I think, for uh, all of us at both uh, the theater center and at the opera, has been the opportunities for our departments to engage with each other and collaborate. Many, many of our staff members have known each other. Jonathan and I have known each other since I arrived in town, and have been talking about various opportunities as well as seeing each other's work and sharing our thoughts and all of that. But and that happens throughout at, at our various staff member levels throughout the institutions, but it's great to actually have a, a piece that, that connects some of those parts of the organization, so our PR and marketing people, our development people, our administration, uh, and even just the fact that, you know, the, the rehearsal room in the Wiley right now uh, for the last week has had opera singers in it uh, is singing operatically, and it's, that is such a kind of titillating curiosity for our admin staff who are one, one floor below, or our, our production staff who are in the middle of tech for a new play that we're doing. And there's just something great about mixing up the, um, the artists, the people in the building, and connecting institutions. Uh, not just the theater and the opera, but, but I hope very much uh, that the other collaborations as well, the opera and the museum, or, or, or bringing the symphony into, into the work or, or the broader community. I think that's, uh, that's enlivening for all of us in all of our uh, institutional silos to constantly find ways to uh, get out and become stronger together. So that's been a great benefit. Yes, even silos have doors. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> There's a Tony winning uh, a Broadway musical director who was then, started, they started hiring her to do opera and I had uh, some friends who were doing her first opera with her in LA, and it was Mozart, it was Magic Flute. And she kept asking, I'm told during rehearsal, well, can we cut out these eight bars? I don't need these eight bars. <laughs> like, no. And then she, she go, well, can we, can we add 16 bars here? I'd like to have some, they go, no. And she, well, why not? And they go, this is Mozart. You don't cut it out, you don't add it. And similarly, you know, a lot of play directors, uh, when they come to opera, they look at the libretto, which first of all is not a, a literal translation often, but they also don't allow for the music. And what music does, I often say, to, to, to sing I love you takes a lot longer than to say, than speaking I love you. And so there's all this music in there. And it's a challenge whether it's standard repertoire or something new like this. There's all this stuff that the composer has put in there for a reason. You don't always know what that reason is. And you better well make up some reason and fill that music. Or not, you know, uh, for whatever your reasons are. But those are challenges that I always see from a th a, the theater director coming in to do an opera. And, and clearly Kevin knows opera and knows a lot about opera. And that's got to help. 
I love the fact that we keep referring to this as a new piece when it was written 30 yeah. years ago. <laughs> <laughs> that says it's something about the it's new to all of us. <laughs> indeed, indeed. I, has anyone in this room actually ever seen a production of Lighthouse? Would well, you like the microphone yes, here? Please tell us <laughs> we have a What's few questions about? for you. <laughs> <laughs> Would you please come to rehearsal? <laughs> Would you like to tell us about the production that you saw? Where did you see it? Oh, good. Could we get this on video? Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> she was enthralled. She's just, it was in Buxton, England. So if, if those of you in the back who can't hear. <laughs> that sounds. I I loved it. When you what, which performance are you coming to? Okay, I want to see you afterward. I want to hear what you have to say, Jane. The piece is about an hour and fifteen twenty minutes. So we're going to do it twice. <laughs> I actually went to a, a symphony concert once where they did a very complex, a challenging piece of music by the uh, uh, Polish composer Penderecki, and they played it through once, and everyone was, you know, kind of, uh, and the conductor turned around and he said, and now that you've heard it, I'm going to play it for you again. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a bad idea. Well, <clears throat> in this case, we want to sell tickets to both performances, so we're not going to do that. Uh, yes, Dr. Wildenthal. Uh. <laughs> I'm so glad you asked that question. Um, he's a doctor, right? <laughs> he is a doctor, but he's not an ENT. Oh, boy. Uh, we just, you know, the Dallas Opera has been very, very, very fortunate. Knock on lots of things. And um, we have uh, had problems before, but we've always found a way to sur survive. And... Uh, the only two performances that we've ever had to cancel were uh, postponed, and uh, they were because the first time was because of the Kennedy assassination, and the opera was uh, Verdi's in Balo and Mascara. Mm. And this production, oddly enough, because uh, the original version that Verdi set was set in Sweden with uh, the assassination of King Gustav III, but because the uh, censors in the, uh, at the time would not allow the assassination of re regicide uh, depicted on the stage. Uh, he set it uh, or changed some of the text, and it was set in colonial Boston. And the finale of Balon Mascara had the assassination of the governor of Massachusetts. And that was the version that was being done on November 22, 1963. It was not canceled, however, and they did the opera the next day. I can't imagine what it must have been like to watch the governor of Boston being assassinated on the stage the day after the Kennedy assassination. And the only other time was a production of Don Giovanni where we had an ice storm. And uh, we rescheduled the production. It was supposed to be Wednesday night. The singers, the orchestra, everyone sa uh, agreed to do it on Friday night and then again on Saturday night. Uh, we did cancel a dress rehearsal once because of an ice storm, but that's, that's it. So, We've been lucky. We've had singers who have gone on who perhaps uh, wouldn't have other, under circum other circumstances because they knew that there was a cover available, uh, and they've somehow gotten through it. So we just hope that all of you stay healthy. <laughs> and no ice. And no ice. Yes. <laughs> no ice, please. Thank you very much, and we we'll look forward to seeing you at the Lighthouse. <laughs>